Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Policy Exchange. My name is Benedict McAleenan. I'm a senior fellow here in the Energy and Environment Unit and managing partner of Helmsley Energy. The policymakers of 2022 face a radically different environment to those of 2021. They face a geopolitical crisis, they face a cost of living crisis, they face an environmental crisis. And nowhere do these crises converge and manifest more clearly than in the energy markets. But these issues are not new. Though they have culminated in recent weeks and months, arguably they were forged by policy decisions in the UK and abroad over the last two decades. Our speaker today has been one of Britain's preeminent voices on energy, uh, energy and the mounting challenges for public policy. Indeed, he has been a fierce critic of the disconnect between what he argues are economic realities on the one hand and political misnomers on the other. So Dieter Helm is Professor of Economic Policy at the University of Oxford and a Fellow in Economics at New College, Oxford. Between 2012 and 2020, he chaired the Government's Independent Natural Capital Committee. He has been an advisor to the UK Government and the European Commission, among others. He was commissioned in 2017 by the UK's Energy Secretary to conduct an independent review of the costs of energy. He has published extensively over many years, not only academic papers, but also a series of books that are highly accessible to a wider audience. His two most recent books, Green and Pleasant Land and Net Zero, set out his pragmatic vision for a more complete economic model that accounts properly for the natural systems on which we all depend. In the 2021 New Year's Honours, he was awarded a knighthood for services to environment, energy, and utilities policy. Over the years, he has been a great friend of the Energy and Environment Unit at Policy Exchange and something of an intellectual ally, having made the case for carbon border adjustments, market-friendly energy policies, and agricultural reforms, just to name a few points of common interest. I'm truly delighted to welcome Sadita here today to discuss how to avoid the next energy crisis, after which, we'll have time for a few questions from the audience. So without further delay, please welcome Professor Sadita Helm. Well, thanks very much for that uh, kind introduction. And it is extremely good to be at the Policy Exchange again. Um, it's been... Uh, uh, a long time of lots of interactions, not always agreements, but lots of interactions, and uh, it's uh, been one of the leading places to debate and discuss and develop energy policy. I was asked today to talk about how to avoid the next energy crisis. That was my exam question, and uh, that's the one I intend to answer. The word crisis is uh, a pretty dangerous one in energy policy terms. It's usually the moment in which most of the most serious mistakes get made. And the reason for that is that when a crisis comes along, the instinct is for people to believe that uh, the crisis context is the new normal. And then extrapolate that new normal out and then for a massive lobby fest to descend upon politicians to beg them to pr protect, support, and do their pet schemes. How many times in the papers recently has it been, at these gas prices, X is a really economic opportunity and the government should do it? Indeed, the industry, and I'll come back to this point at the moment, is getting very good at what I call the NFU approach to policy, which is, my ask of government is... That's the opening phrase for a discussion of agricultural policy from the NFU. Now, I don't criticise uh, that lobby fest. I just think one should be very wary. And at the heart of the current crisis is the assumption, just as 
with enough grey hair I remember 1979, the assumption that oil and gas prices are now at a new level and can only go up. And therefore, all sorts of things which are competitive in inverted commas, so not when the full costs are necessarily taken into account, at, say, 120, 130, 140, 160, $200 oil, and the current gas price, or even as high as it was last October, now we should do these things because they're economic. And a good example of that was our current Secretary of State, who I think said that we should do nuclear because it's a protection against high and volatile gas prices. My question is, so you know the gas price is going to be high and volatile in 2035? <coughs> Great. So one has to be very careful to look through the abiding assumptions in a crisis and make sure that one doesn't make a whole host of policy decisions which depend upon the numbers in that crisis being normal and stretched into the future. Actually, markets work, and almost every energy crisis that's been a price spike has been followed by a price collapse. So by 1994, the oil price was on the floor, having been at $39 in 1979, and everybody assuming it was going to go on up from $39. And just to reference that and give it a bit of context, $39 in 79 is, what, about $150, $160 a day, something of that order? I think the oil price has only once in the last 40 years touched the level it was in 1979 in real terms. The long-run path of oil, which is to gradually decline in real terms for the last 150 years, usually reasserts itself because high prices bring forward supply, supply responds to demand, and down goes the price. Now, I'm not predicting that's going to happen, but my opening comment is beware of assumptions made in crises underpinning longer-term policy decisions. There are policy things that ought to be done in crises, but they're about the crisis themselves. And in the current context, the capital stock is largely given. And so there's very little that can be done in the heat of the crisis other than to reduce demand and to use public funds to protect customers from the scale of the shock that's hitting them. So I'm not suggesting we go back to the 70s when the average house was heated to 13 degrees in winter. From its current, I think offices are about 22 degrees now and houses are in the 20, uh, 20 above. I'm not suggesting we go back, but if you were really worried about doing something urgently, you'd get people to turn down the thermometer one or two degrees and drive at 60 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour or whatever. I'm not suggesting you should do those things, but those are the sorts of things you can do immediately. And in the case of Germany and Austria, at the moment, plan for rationing, uh, particularly into the autumn, were the gas supplies to uh, be choked off. Uh, and, of course, there's the issue about customs bills. What a crisis should really be used for is to ask fundamental questions and to ask whether the crisis we have at the moment is being caused by energy policy mistakes and how those mistakes, if there are mistakes, could be rectified going forward so that any exogenous, exogenous shock in the future, and there are bound to be more of them, is then met by a robust and resilient market. And our current position, pre the Russian invasion of Ukraine, was demonstrated, was uh, characterized by customers paying too much. The costs were not equated with the prices. A lack of resilience, so that one storm could leave people without power for 10 days. What happened to the tree lopping? We've had. 28 or 29 suppliers going bust, right, uh, leaving the problems for you and me to pay for. And I would say the 235 target for decarbonising electricity looks further and further over the horizon as day after day passes. We're not in a good place, and on climate change, we're not in a good place either. The world is 80% dependent on fossil fuels, about the same as it was in 1970, and that's true for Germany 
and the UK too. This idea that we're on a fast track to no longer causing climate change doesn't stand up very clearly against the overwhelming dependence on purchasing products which contain that huge component of carbon within them. In my Net Zero book, I suggest people keep a carbon diary and write down what they do all day and then think through the carbon involved in that and then imagine writing that in 28 years' time with no carbon in it or hardly any. Then you'll see the scale of the challenge. And on the climate change side, come back to in a second, I think the public have been led to believe that when they get to net zero, they'll be no longer causing climate change. If only. If only. Because it's a territorial carbon production total and target that is not equivalent to not causing climate change. Remember, consumption is what matters ultimately, actually in all economic models, but consumption of carbon is the measure we should look at, and the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere is the greenhouse effect and therefore the causal frame for climate change. Our carbon consumption isn't falling very much, and that's reflected back in the 80% fossil fuels that our economy depends upon. Um, and um, uh, we have the notion that if we just close down some more of British industry, we'll do better en route. If you want to get your numbers down for the net zero target, if you want to be really successful and you want to do some things quickly, well, I'll tell you what to do. Close Ineos, uh, the Grangemouth plant, close the other six refineries, hope that British steel collapses completely and hope that Brexit finishes off the car industry. Oh, and um, hopefully the fertiliser industry will be finished off by the gas price too. That will bring the emissions down. We will do even better and we'll increase our contribution to climate change. You do not stop causing climate change just because you get to net zero territorial carbon production. And one day the public's going to find that out. But the world has. Last year, during the lockdowns for the pandemic or the plague, in that year, we added another two parts per million of carbon to the atmosphere, as we have done every single year since 1990. There isn't a blip, not even for the financial crisis. So if you think that net zero carbon territorial production targets are going to end your contribution to climate change, Britain's contribution, and make a difference to global warming, think again. It's a much more demanding requirement, which we ought to engage in, because after all, a lot of that carbon up there has been put up there since the Industrial Revolution by us. But our target is, is in one sense, delusional. It does not deliver what people think it delivers, which is stopping causing climate change, which I believe most of the public rightly uh, think they should be doing. So we don't start in a good position in our energy policies. The outcomes are not good. And that has a massive upside. It's quite hard to do it worse, and it's not that hard to do it a lot better than we currently do it. So we shouldn't waste the crisis. We should identify why the crisis hits so hard in the UK. And remarkably, despite the fact we don't import much, quote, Russian gas, we're one of the most hardest hit countries by uh, the price spikes. Um, uh, we should think how to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And to do that, you have to drill down into policy and think hard about why it, despite all the benevolent intentions, all the goodwill, all the political capital that's embedded in our energy policies, why it produces the results it does. And I, I'm not going to show you uh, um, uh, lots of slides, but I'm going to show you two. And these slides are about how policy evolves. It's about the political economy of policy. And in particular, they're about how we ended up with something so complicated that nobody understands and can list even the main interventions. So if, like me, you wear glasses and you trot off to the optician to have your eyes tested, you will be familiar with looking at that 
uh, chart, uh, which has the letters up there. And if you're uh, silly like me, you try and outsmart the, the optician and try and remember the line so you can do better next time round as you go down. But you'll see, and it, is my first slide up? Yeah, good. You'll see um, a slide, and um, someone in my office thought that the way to do this in the letters would be to say, can you see an energy policy uh, uh, anywhere? Okay. And you can read those letters. Now, the litmus test I have for an energy policy is if I put it up next to the optician's slide a list of all the current interventions going on in the energy sector, can you read any of it? Right? And the answer is, I think, and that's my second slide, um, and by the way, I don't know them all either, so this is only just a first uh, 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 trawl of it. I, I think that's true. You can't read them at that distance. And what it tells you is it's fantastically complicated. The number of bodies involved, the number of... Um, uh, initiatives, strategies, um, uh, frameworks, uh, you know, you name it, carbon prices, uh, CFD sales, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just immense. And what, why we've got to that is not nobody sat down and thought, let's make it really difficult. What happens is every time there's a problem, someone invents a new policy because the government has to be seen to do something. Right? You have to have a strategy on heating. You have to have a strategy on building. You have to have a CFD for this. You have to have a CFD for that. And what that does is open up government to the maximum degree of lobbying. So I was asked yesterday about a project, it's a very interesting project, called um, LINXX, or LINXX, about um, uh, uh, solar energy from Morocco taken by cable to Devon. And there was a lot, big spin about how wonderful it was. Well, it may all be true. Right? Right? And then I read down. All we need from government is a CFD. My ask of government is a CFD. Once the government ends up being the central purchaser of everything, it's the client. And the way you make money is to get the best contract for government for each component part. That's why you have this enormous mass out there and a lobbying industry to match it, but the outcomes aren't improved. Fine if it works, but it doesn't. So what should you do if you wanted to create a simpler framework, a robust framework, and a framework that could get us through the next decade or two? And the question that I had in the Cost of Energy Review it's the same questions I'm trying to address now. How do you have security of supply and decarbonize at the same time? That was my exam question then, and I think that is the exam question now. The bit in between, the five years since I did the review, has been all about pursuing decarbonization, not much attention for security supply, and then you get hit by a security supply problem, and suddenly it's all about security supply and we'll worry about the climate later. No. You've got two objectives, and the question is, what framework is best designed to achieve those outcomes? Now, I've always tried to persuade my students that a good way of thinking about a problem is to try and get the question right first. Because if you get the question right, usually the answer follows fairly straightforwardly. So in the case of energy policy, the primary task of government is to define clearly, in a meaningful way, not waffle, what the objectives actually are. So you might think, well, security supply, um, climate change, and Tony Blair wanted it to be cheap energy, which was also secure and sustainable. That's what he set out in his uh, white paper in 2003. But you'd think it's pretty clear what security you want um, uh, low carbon. Well, it's far from clear. I've already said that the net zero objective is not specified in a way which addresses climate change efficiently and appropriately. Now, you might say, well, we've got the Climate Change Act, we have to live with it. Yeah, but it's not sustainable, and therefore it will not be sustained. It will not produce the result that you intend to get, because it's not trying to limit climate change. It's trying to lower territorial carbon emissions, full stop. 
So you have to clarify that objective. And you can doctor the objective by putting a carbon border tax in, which makes a carbon territorial production target look like a unilateral carbon consumption target. And if you spread the price of carbon to heating agriculture, the largest polluter relative to its size in carbon terms by a country mile, uh, transport, heating, agriculture, the economy, and the trading position too. Then you've got a carbon consumption target, but we don't. Okay? So if your objective is net zero carbon production, then you should be going about trying to close Grangemouth. You should be trying to close the steel industry uh, as part of your policy to achieve your objective. That's what I mean by being clear about the objective. That may be uncomfortable for people, and it may be uncomfortable for politicians and all those people who signed up for the Climate Change Act, but I have to tell you, it's not the right question. And the consequences cannot be hidden by pursuing the wrong question. They were out. They will not be sustained. Now, on security supply, you might think, oh, it's just having physical molecules. Really? Okay. So I heard the Secretary of State explain um, that um, there was no physical problem of security of supply to the select committee. I'm sure it's true. It's very uninteresting. Supply always equals demand. Supposing the price of gas went up 12,000% tomorrow morning, would we have secure supplies? Yeah, we wouldn't use any. Demand is affected by price, and security supply cannot escape the affordability bit. Right? And we have the situation of tankers going through the Panama Canal one way and coming back the other way and us paying the highest price for them. If the government's policy is purely physical security supply, no problem. You just follow through the consequence. We will pay the highest price for any LNG cargo in the world if we're short. Much easier to turn the factories off. That's what's happening. Okay? So you can't have a security supply target without a view about price as a component part of that. And then you have to realise that risk cannot be reduced to zero, much as many uh, of the public sometimes imagine governments can do. They can prevent deaths from this and prevent deaths from that. They can reduce the probability. It's not a free good to have a really big supply margin by the capacity margin in electricity. You have to decide how much you're prepared to have against what costs and make a judgment. But someone has to make that call because it's a public good, not a private good, and that's for the state to uh, attend to. So clarify the objectives. That should be the first half of any energy bill coming out, if not more. We'd be a lot further forward if it was absolutely clear what it was the government had defined as the objectives, the questions to which this energy system should be the answer. Now, the next bit of a proper energy policy is what I call stakes in the ground. Actually, Greg Clark is the person who invented that concept and took it a very long way with that industrial strategy paper with uh, uh, corporate solutions for about 120 sectors of the economy. Um, but um, stakes in the ground are basically about core decisions in the energy sector that private markets can't take or won't take efficiently. Number one is nuclear power. The point about nuclear power is that it involves societal and therefore political opportunities and risks which transcend even a generation, and particularly on the waste for thousands of years for some of it. That's not a decision that private companies can make. It's also not a decision that companies can make to build nuclear reactors if they have the bankruptcy constraint. There are not limited liabilities. The Treasury ends up with unlimited liabilities for nuclear technology. doesn't mean they shouldn't take them, but it means that ultimately government cannot avoid the decision. It's no accident that most nuclear power is built by governments, on government money, with government-owned companies. I'm not advocating you have to have government-owned companies. I'm simply making that point. So Mr Macron wants to build six. 
French Treasury will raise, what, 50 billion? And EDF, it proposes to fully nationalize, will deliver it. That is a program. It is the cheapest form of finance, given the political and regulatory risk involved. And it has the instrument to do it. Whether it's a good idea, another matter. Okay? But when you make nuclear decisions, what you don't want to do is decide to, well, let's try three and see which one works. That's British policy up to date. Actually, let's try four, because we'll, we'll promise the Chinese they can have another one at Bradwell if the other ones work. Right? It's called creative tension. You wait 10 years to find out if one of them works, and then you decide what you're going to do subsequently. I'm afraid nuclear isn't like that. Um, a, um, it's not language I would use, but the Prime Minister's language of being gung-ho about nuclear is really, in one sense, correct. You either do it and do it properly and have a programme, or you don't do it. What is the point of building one SMR if the whole idea is to have factory production? We're going to build the factory, do one uh, SMR, see if it works, and then decide we might have some more orders later. Right? Similarly with reactors. And people say, well, you can't pick technologies. Look what Tony Baird, Ben did when he picked AGRs. A lot of sympathy with that view. But then that's true of picking particular fighter aircrafts in defense, picking particular uh, technologies uh, like used by different armies and uh, arms manufacturers in Ukraine. Do you think Ukraine is well served by, let's try four or five different stingers and see which one works. Actually, they're probably so short of them, it'd probably be a good idea if they did. But you see my point. So one of the stakes in the ground is nuclear, and my argument on this is do it properly or don't do it. The worst is try one and see if it works because we want to hold back the public expenditure. And that has been the history. Remember, in the really big energy crisis in 79-80, Mrs. Thatcher announced... Ten nuclear reactors were going to be built. And, by the way, we owned the CGB then, so we had the equivalent of EDF to do it. One of them materialised in 1994 called Sizewell. Nothing else happened. Was that a good idea? Was that a sound investment? Just one? Right. Well, might, might or might not be because it was a replication of something else that's being constructed. But you really have to do a think about supply chains, and all the component parts in this. And that is a stake in the ground which governments have to decide. What is really worse than any of the, those two outcomes, try one and see it works, or a program, is deciding that we'll think about deciding. Because since it's such chunky stuff in the electricity system, what does everyone else do? Do you think in 2035, if you're thinking about offshore wind or you're thinking about gas or something else, that you should say... Well, I'm not sure whether the government will have built enough to supply 20, 25% of total capacity or nothing, and we'll just be left with size will be. How do you do that? Raises everyone's cost of capital. Right? That's what I mean by stake in the ground. Either put the stake in or don't put the stake in and put the right kind of stake in, not a bamboo twig. That would be my approach. Now, the other stakes in the ground. Uh, hydrogen's clearly one of those. There's a lot of R&D involved in that framework. Not clear whether offshore wind is really a stake in the ground, although it does require that the network is built for it. That depends on whether we have a market which incentivizes the low-carbon technologies to bid in and prove their economic worth. And that, of course, is my equivalent firm, Power Market, which is at the center of the um, cost of energy review, an equivalent firm power is, by the way, what security supply in electricity means. So you will have equivalent firm power. You can just find much more expensive ways of getting there, or you can find much more open auction routes. Firm power is what is security supply, because that's the amount of capacity you will have at a point in time on your system. Okay? And equivalent firm power recognises that quite a lot of the intermediate technologies add something to security, but not... 100% firm, and of course it incentivizes the providers of um, uh, intermittent technology to firm up their capacity, and that of course really rocket fires the market in balancing 
uh, support technologies, batteries, uh, demand side management, and leave that to the market to get on with, rather than another heap of policies to add to the optician's reading list uh, to try to see on the screen. I might come back to that in a bit, but um, let me push on. So the stakes in the ground are the decisions government has to make, and it needs to make them, and right now it needs to make them pretty damn fast because it has to get to net zero on the electricity system within 12.7 years. 12.7 years. You just think how much investment has to take place between now and then. Not the 1% of GDP that the uh, Climate Change Committee would have us believe is the likely cost. By the way, the 1% of GDP assumes no government failures. The government is going to be perfect. And that's where you get to the 1% of GDP. Think of smart meters. Think of the AGRs. You know, just think, think, think. If anyone designs an energy policy on the assumption that government will get it perfectly right and tells the public that's all that's going to cost them, that lets them down a great deal. What we need, if we mean 2035, is a plan. You won't get there by leaving it to markets for 12.7 years. Right? You need to know what the configuration is going to be. You need to plan the networks to join up the offshore winds, not these bilateral links. You need a proper offshore grid, and quickly, in a matter of a few years. You need to integrate the offshore grid with the onshore grid in a matter of years. You need to get the demand side and all these other characteristics of balancing the intermittent wind done very quickly. And that plan is noticeable by its absence. That's why if I was an investor, I'd have no confidence in achieving the 235 target. And I'll tell you why I really wouldn't have any confidence. Because between now and then, whether we like it or not, gas will play a big role in balancing up the intermittent wind, especially if we build lots of offshore wind, which I'm not against at all. Nothing I say is, is suggesting a preference for any technology. It's just spelling it out. Offshore wind, onshore wind is disaggregated, decentralized, low density, intermittent power. That's what it is. And what's more, as you put more wind on the system, the wholesale market price gets destroyed on regular occasions when the price goes to zero. It renders all the gas intermittent too. In fact, it renders everything else intermittent once you start to get to 40 gigawatts plus on the system. So you're going to have to be using a lot of gas, whether you like it or not. And you've made the gas generation more expensive by making it intermittent in the process. This is all part of the cost of putting intermittent technology on the system. So when people tell you, we built a wind farm, it's enough to power X thousand homes, they never put when the wind blows after it in the quote. I've had this discussion repeatedly with the FT and the, and the economist. And that's not to criticise wind. It's simply to say, if you keep telling me this stuff is free in the sense of it's lower <laughs> cost than the alternatives on the system, then either get outside Parliament with a placard saying end renewable subsidies now. Wouldn't that be wonderful? If it really is cheaper, it would win all the auctions. There'd be nothing else we'd have to worry about. But it isn't, because it's intermittent, and we need to subsidise and support renewables to build them on the system in order to achieve our climate goals. So I'm not against subsidising these things. I'm against the claim that they don't need subsidies, because I'm against the claim that they are the marginal cost of generation is the cost of wind, and that certainly isn't true. So on the gas side, we will need a lot of gas. We need to make sure it's secure. And we'll have to have a complete CCS system by 235, because if the electricity system is to be net zero by that date, then that gas has to be net zero too, and that requires CCS. That's a stake in the ground that's missing. And there's no evidence whatsoever that CCS at scale will be with us in 12.7 years, sufficient to meet the 235 target. <coughs> now, the market's important. And the equivalent firm power is a recognition of a moving towards a zero marginal cost world. The old wholesale markets are 20th century uh, phenomena, not what we need going forward. 
I spelt out how to do that in the uh, uh, cost of energy review, and all the lobbyists hated it because, of course, it would confront them with the costs of the intermittency. Uh, I'm not known for uh, saying what I think people would like to hear, but if you want the cheapest way of securing the capacity, uh, which is both secure and meets the climate objectives, then equivalent firm power is the answer. You would need strategic reserves, particularly on the gas front. I'm in favour of licensing for the North Sea for future gas fields to come with requirements with regard to the landing of that gas and the contracts associated with it moving towards a more contracted base and away from a uh, uh, volatile spot-only world, which is very much part and parcel of our energy security crisis, uh, both for Europe and ourselves, and much motivated by the British pressure on the Europeans to go to spot wholesale markets to the almost exclusivity of everything else and destroy the long-term contracts. That's part of it. Of course, you want to end the perverse subsidies, and there are loads of perverse subsidies. I won't mention the culprits here, but we all know what they are across, I think we do, across the sector. And then finally, what you need to do, which brings me all the way back to where I started on the energy crisis, you need to stop people paying a price which is way above the costs of electricity. There is no good reason why people should be paying average bills of 2000 and there's no good reason why they should pay bills of 3,000. We're not in the French position and having the luxury of being able to say bills only need to go up 4% because almost all the costs have not changed because the gas price has gone up. Nukes plus hydro costs have hardly changed. Of course, EDF complains the loss is going to lose 8 billion. What they really mean is we could have sold the electricity to the Germans our nuclear energy, because they don't like nuclear energy over there. And we could have sold it to the Germans at the marginal cost of electricity, which is the marginal cost of gas in our current wholesale market structures. But since France owns most of EDF, it just would have shown up as a windfall on the uh, accounts of EDF. So either the French taxpayers could have had the $8 billion or the French, and, and, and increased the prices to customers, or the customers could have a 4% increase. I think the 4% increase is a rather good idea and rather sensible. Now look here, in this country, lots of our costs have nothing to do with the price of gas. But if you look at the correlation between the electricity wholesale price and the gas wholesale <coughs> price, and look at the exposure to spot markets, you will observe that everything is being charged the marginal cost of gas. This is nonsense. And then, I haven't got time now, and I'll stop in just a second, but on top of that, why are we paying what we're paying for distribution. When I did the cost of energy review, I pointed out that there was a really good case for direct intervention immediately to do something about what was going on uh, in terms of the returns. But after Storm Ar 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 Arwin, we now know that they don't even deliver the services that they're supposed to for these extraordinarily abnormal profits that are being earned. Why are customers choosing between cooking and heating uh, or, or use of electricity and those profits are still out there, way beyond anything that anyone needs to earn on those kind of activities. And on supply, where do you start? Why am I paying 60 quid? Because the regulators failed to regulate the suppliers properly, and the suppliers took a punt on the spot price and could walk away with the bankruptcy constraint and dump all the liabilities back onto ourselves. Now, I went through the entire supply chain generation all the way through in the cost of energy review, and the central conclusion of the cost of energy review is consumers were paying too much in 2017. Well, they certainly are now, and hopefully some people who are going to suffer a lot as a result of nearly £3,000 bills will be rescued quick and fast. And that is something you should do in a crisis. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Sadita. That was um, uh, an eye-opening speech in, in lots of different ways. Um, in a moment, we're going to open to the floor, both here in the room and also uh, the, the many people logged in online. Um, so if you are online, please could you um, raise your electronic hand on Zoom. It's at the bottom of the screen. 
Uh, for those in the room, we have a, a very novel system whereby you raise your actual hand <laughs> and uh, let us know. And uh, please wait for the microphone if, uh, if that's the case. Um, I'm going to use Chair's prerogative for the moment. Um, and uh, you did touch on some of these, uh, well, you certainly touched on, on, on a lot of these points, but I, I wondered if we could, uh, if I could delve into the nature of this crisis um, as to whether you think that this is actually, this does have the potential to disrupt actual supplies. Um, should, should we characterise this as an energy supply crisis? Or is it the point that you ended on, which is just a matter, or well, not just, but, but a matter of increasing levels of discomfort in terms of the price? Okay, so memories are very short. So the price spike was in October last year, when, foolishly, many politicians and many people thought that Putin wouldn't actually invade. Now, I've written papers on uh, Crimea and papers on South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and this is in the copybook. Right? <laughs> the trail is just enormous. So these price increases were coming before we got to the Russian invasion. And if we look at the Russian invasion, it's a geopolitical crisis. The idea that in this century, in my lifetime, I've seen the Berlin Wall come down and optimism for Eastern Europe flourish. But for a butcher to go on doing that in, in Ukraine, in my lifetime, is horror. It's terrible. It's like the concentration camps in, in China. I never expected these totalitarian things to happen again. They are happening. That's a geopolitical one. Is it an energy price, energy market crisis? Well, it is if you're in Germany. And it is if you're in Austria. If you're silly enough to build the Nord Stream pipeline and then build the second one and turn your economy to a position of you know, almost utter dependency on Russian gas, this is the consequence of flow. But the thing is, the gas is still flowing to Germany. For all the talk, there actually hasn't been a significant reduction of gas flow. And you know, if Putin was to fall from power or with a peace deal, do we think our German friends would say, well, we're still not taking any gas from you, mate? I'm not sure. And then all that oil going out of the world market. So it isn't disappearing. It's ending up on ships in India who are buying cheap Ural tankers. Okay? So the amount of volume here involved is actually so far quite small. Um, the real fundamental started earlier. And that's having a gas market which is entirely spot. Okay? And having in the UK a position where we have no contractual base with the North Sea, no gas storage, and think that our gas security policy is we'll pay the highest price for an LNG cargo on the high seas. So I think the, the answer is there is a real fundamental problem. It's about the structure of markets. And anyone who's genuinely interested in capitalism understands that spot markets always, all, almost always work best when they're supported by a nexus of longer-term contracts underneath. That's the problem. That's what we destroyed. And that's why I made the point about why we should do the licensing rounds for Jack Doe and other things in the North Sea to reconstruct a contractual framework which gives us some security in price through contraction frameworks <coughs> as well as just the physical volume. So do you agree with the government that we face no threats to UK uh, energy supply? Well, um, uh, I, I rarely agree with any <laughs> government. Um, but um, um, physically, I think we can always get our physical gas. It's just the price. And my guess is the price might be sufficiently high that we don't want it. Supply always equals demand ex post. 101 economics. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to the floor, so those in the room, um, sir, at the front, um, if you could uh, wait for the microphone and then let us know your name and any organisation that you represent. And keep it to a question rather than a... Yeah. Uh, a Hi there, my, main, my name is William Orchard, Orchard Department of London Limited, and uh, we know Deke way back. I'm an expert on sort of combined heat and power. And interestingly enough, I did the energy policy work for AEA Ricardo for Ukraine. Um, have the Ukrainians uh, taken my recommendations as to what they should do with their power plants, they would have built a lot of combined heat and power plants at their 11,000 volt to 415 volt interface with a store of liquid fuel or run them on gas. And in that way, 
Putin would not have been able to cut off the electricity and the heat. Can I ask you to get to a question yes, yes, uh, as soon as possible? What, I, I'm, what my question here is, in the modeling that is done nowadays, a lot of the modeling is done in primary energy terms, whereas energy, fundamentally, as a, to optimize it, needs to be done in exegetic terms, using the second law of thermodynamics. Well, let me just come back on it, uh, Bill. So, um, so it's the issue is why are they modeling in primary energy okay, terms? Okay. So, and why so are they modeling in price terms instead of cost terms? Great. Thank okay. you very much. So, so, so very, two or three very quick answers. First of all, in the cost of energy review, I didn't cover this in the reason I want to split the uh, system operators out is because there has to be a system architecture to this. It's a system. Okay? And that's a very core cool part of the cost of energy. But I want it especially for the DNOs, for the distributions. I want the regional system operators split out. And one of the features that makes that even more important today than it did five years ago is because you probably can't solve the heating problem other than by having integrated local elements of CHP to it. That's what many Europeans do. I don't know if it's the right answer, but you need the Falcon for doing it. As for energy modeling, I remember talking to Nigel Lawson when he became Secretary of State for Energy in, 90, in 82, 83, and he got to the Department of Energy and he said, I don't know what these people do. Right? He didn't understand why the modeling was taking place because what he thought was that markets had sort that out. And quite a lot of that, in terms of my equivalent firm power, is what I want to do too. So mine's a very pro-competitive, very auctioned one. As to modeling, in our modern age, I think the system architect, the system operator, should post up uh, system plans on the website for everybody to throw their modeling at. And all the modeling you describe, everyone else's can be challenged to that, and then you end up with a framework for the auctions as to what you're going to take forward and the network development. Thank you. I'm going to turn to our online audience next. Barney McIntyre. Um, Barney, are you there? Name and organisation. Can you hear me? Please. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yes, go for it. Ah, oh, yeah, Barney McIntyre at Thomas Media. Um, this is a question on nuclear. I, I wondered, is the proposed uh, regulated asset-based asset model uh, for financing new nuclear, is that a good idea given the public's huge concern over high bills? Uh, and I wondered whether DC could answer whether he thinks it will assure private investors anyway. Okay, so um, I wrote the paper on RAV model for nuclear, not because I was advocating nuclear. I'm completely agnostic on the subject, but I regard it as the best way of financing it. Okay? Nuclear power station, it's all about the cost of capital. Right? We're paying 9% real for um, Hinkley. That tells you how not to do it. Right? You can't make nuclear uh, a really thriving economic proposition at 9%. The risk of nuclear, much of it ends up on government, unlimited liability, and therefore you have to think about um, should the money be borrowed so that future consumers can pay for it, or should you have pay as you go? Throughout all the great economic growth period and the 7% growth of electricity per year from 1945 to the early 80s, pay-as-you-go was the way things were done. The reason pay-as-you-go was done was not just it was an intergenerational bargain, a chain letter. Each generation paid for the capex for the next generation. It's the fact that in the UK, we don't have any savings. And savings have to equal investment. You know, you know just because you borrow, you borrow from somebody's savings. And one of the characteristics of this economy, which is overwhelmingly driven on consumption, is we do not provide the savings to finance the investments across all the infrastructure that we have an obligation to bequeath to the next generation at least as good state as our own. What pay-as-you-go is, is essentially forced savings by customers to pay for investment. Right? China did it on a much bigger scale, 30% of GDP plus. Right? But effectively, when I pay that RAB bill for investment in the process of assets, in the process of construction, I'm essentially being forced to do the savings to finance the investment. That's why the cost of capital is low. 
So if the British public wants to live their consumption nirvana, which they obviously do, and if they want to vote for politicians, they're always going to be increased in consumption. You can't get away from where the hell is the savings going to come for investment other than from foreigners. And then you want foreign future generations to pay for it. And remember, we're doing this to clean up the carbon mess that my generation has massively contributed to. So that's why I think we should think very hard in infrastructure, in a sustainable economy, about rat-based models, which essentially are forced savings to finance investment to bequeath to the next generation a set of assets at least as good as we, we had. But by the way, compared with the messing around with various treasury models, PFIs, and all the other things, if you just want to get the cost of capital down, but you don't want the government to raise the money itself directly, which I think is the best route in nuclear, then the answer is the RAD model is pretty damn good. Because effectively, what will be happening is, when people invest in the RAD for nuclear, I bet you the risks are so circumscribed that they're buying a proxy for an index-linked government guilt. Right? So my answer is, well, you just do the guilt in the first place. right? But essentially, when you see the cost of capital on Thames Tideway, that's effectively a guilt. You know? Coronavirus? I'm a customer of Thames. I don't live anywhere near London, by the way. Right? I'm right at the top of the Thames. We have a sewage works that uh, overflows four hours a day, by the way. Right? Um, I'm up there. I'm paying for that, that coronavirus delay and cost increase for the Thames Tideway in my bill. Right? That's a guilt. That's cost pass through. That's rate of return. That isn't risk in construction. Right? Just like if you go to Heathrow, I don't fly anymore, but if you go to that place called Heathrow, you're going to be paying higher bills because the volume went down during the coronavirus. That's, again, like guilt. And you should uh, bear in mind the cost to the British economy of pretending that something isn't on the government balance sheet when, in fact, it is. Thank you. We've got a few more minutes. Yes, sir, uh, near the back there. So you may not agree, but I think much of the architecture of the framework I'm interested in is already in place. So we have a capacity market. The government is the central buyer. Right? Nobody does a merchant plant. Right? Everything is purchased by the government. That's why the lobby fest is out there. The difference is that the government decides different prices for all the components it wants to buy for capacity. Different price for offshore, different for onshore, different for um, DRACs. Eight, nine hundred million a year for burning wood pellets. Anyway, another side there. Um, uh, you can decide whether that's a perverse subsidy or not. But uh, we already have a capacity component because essentially, when you're zero marginal cost, all you are is capacity. Right? And by the way, switching, you're switching from what? Right? As I showed in the cost of energy, you can't switch from the distribution cost. You can't switch from the transmission cost. You can't switch from the CFDs. You can't switch from the capacity payments. There is virtually nothing left to switch from, okay? except this notion of wholesale price, which brought the whole thing tumbling down, right? and may yet do more damage going forward. Okay? So much of it's already in place. Now, the additional bit, which isn't in the cost of energy review, but I've thought a lot about since, is that in the bit that is marginal, right, which is the gas, because we don't have much coal, that's off there, in that component part, the... Um, the reason it's so damn volatile is because they're no long-term contracts. Now, you have to ask yourself, why no long-term contracts? So, in my view, which is a very market-orientated competition view, I think that markets exist to serve customers. 
right? I'm a customer. You know what? I don't want to pay the spot price of electricity in real time. I'd like a one-year contract. If I was on the average income in this country or the average household income, even one year might be a struggle for me. I want stability. Right? So the question is, in a capitalist market, the capitalist should be serving my interests. Nobody asked me whether I wanted spot pricing. Right? I do not want to spend my evening searching around trying to sort out between these different supply deals what I'm getting. And I do want to know what my bill is going to be every month because I want to know, in my case, a year ahead, maybe more. Okay? So if you had to supply me on a one-year basis, or maybe longer, you wouldn't be trading on spot yourself. You'd be going in the market and looking for some longer-term contracts. You would construct a portfolio with some very long-term contracts, some shorter-term contracts, and yes, some spot. Okay? And that's where world is. Now, of course, the dispatch and the balancing comes from the old model of the system marginal price, which is the short-run marginal cost of the last plant on the system. Right? But I don't have to pay that. That's what all these financial instruments can sort out. I want to leave that to you. You sort all that out. You sort out the balancing. You sort out to make your intermittent production more um, uh, firm. And you sort out how you want to aggregate demand side responses and all that kind of stuff. You offer people all sorts of contracts. But within the framework, the, what the consumer actually wants is price stability. I have never switched, except when I was forced to switch, it was horrific. Right? And I still can't get my supplier from the house I've left to accept I've moved. But I can't even get my water company to accept that I'm a customer of theirs. It's appalling. And you look at the margin that's charged the service charge for supply. What do you get for all that money? And it's a perfectly reasonable market oriented question to ask is, what the hell am I paying for? Why am I paying all this lot? And then I see how they behave. The 28 has gone bust. And then I get a bill for 60 quid to clear up the mess that's left after them. This is not a satisfactory way of running a market. And that's why I go around the equivalent firm power and then push the balancing back to the market for the players to sort out for themselves. That's a very open market frame. And there's a fundamental political economy point here. Less a fair markets are typically awful. Markets work best when the state provides a framework within which they operate. That's why capitalism developed during the Tudor period, because there was a firm grip on law and order. Governments guarantee property rights. And when it comes to infrastructure, the opportunities that are out there for people in the energy sector depend on the infrastructure being there. And that's a system, not a series of discrete parts. And these are lessons we have to learn if we're to rebase energy policy on a sensible basis so that those customers are not paying 2,000 quid, which they don't deserve to be charged. And they're going to react to that. Sorry, I, I feel quite strongly about it because you know, there are people in my village who really are in difficulty. And there are going to be lots of them this autumn. And they've got the food bills to pay as well. And while we can discuss the niceties of these things, if it's true that people are paying more than they need to in these circumstances, I think it behoves regulators and government to do something about it. Thank you very much, Sir Dieter. Um, I'm afraid we have run out of time. Sorry. We've actually run slightly over. But um, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you all very much for joining us, um, both online and in the room. Thank you very much indeed to you, Sadita, for, um, uh, for, for presenting uh, a, a really timely and, and fascinating intervention. We're, it's been a pleasure and an honour to have you here. Well, thank you very much. Um, a recording of uh, today's uh, discussion and speech will be online, both on the uh, Policy Exchange YouTube channel and on our website. Um, there's lots of other events going on. Uh, all the time on this and a range of other subjects related to the current crisis and wider issues. So thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.